Marceline was always a kind and somewhat naive girl. During her primary school years, she began fainting, and doctors soon discovered that she had a heart defect. They warned Marceline and her parents that she might not live to adulthood. Despite this, Marceline was determined not to leave this world so soon. At age 17, Marceline fell in love with Paul, married him at 19, and found out she was pregnant at 20. Doctors categorically forbade her from giving birth, warning her of the risks to both her and the child. Do you understand what a risk this is? Both you and the child can die, frowned the obstetrician gynecologist, urging Marceline to stop the pregnancy. When a woman carries a child, her heart and blood vessels experience tremendous stress. Only a healthy body can cope with it, not yours. But Marceline couldn't imagine getting rid of her beloved child, even though her husband discouraged her from taking such a step. He was worried about his wife, but the young woman was determined. As predicted, Marceline's pregnancy was difficult, and she gave birth prematurely. Doctors had to bring her back from the brink of death, but the son was born healthy. Soon, Marceline recovered. From that moment, their small family was happy, until one fateful incident. That evening, Marceline was waiting for her husband and son to come home. Paul was supposed to pick up their child from the football session, where he went after school. Marceline was humming a pop song that got stuck in her head like an old record. She was setting the table, anticipating a family dinner. It was Friday, so it was their tradition. After dinner, they usually played board games. Marceline looked at the clock for the fifth time. Her husband and son were delayed. At that moment, her phone rang. The woman smiled, noticing that her son had called. Ever since Edward got a phone, he used any excuse to call his parents. Hello, Edward, where are you? Why are you late? asked his mother. Mum! The child's voice, filled with horror, came from the receiver, and the smile vanished from Marceline's face. She sat on a stool, feeling her strength leave her instantly. What happened? she whispered, turning pale. Mum! Dad doesn't move! the child said. The words pierced the woman's heart. Her lips trembled. She closed her eyes and tried to take a breath. Edward, where are you? Are you okay? Explain what happened. Then Marceline heard the most terrible sound for any mother. Her child's crying. It wasn't crying over just a broken knee or because he didn't get a toy. Edward was crying rackingly. We... we crashed, the child muttered. Marceline jumped up, rushing around the kitchen like a tiger in a cage. Her hand was squeezing the phone so hard that the plastic was about to crack. Edward, tell me where you are. I'm coming. Marceline realized she had to hang up and call the police, but she couldn't drop her son's call. With a heavy heart and trembling, Marceline reassured her child that everything would be okay and then called the police. They informed her that they had already responded to the scene, and once Marceline learned where the accident had occurred, she rushed there. Upon arrival, she saw her son in the ambulance. The woman rushed to him, feeling a wave of relief, but it was short-lived. Where's my husband? she asked. What happened? A truck cut off the car, the officer explained. Your husband drove straight into it at high speed. The child was in the back in a car seat. He is unharmed. The impact hit the front of the car and crushed it. The man died on the spot. I'm sorry. Marceline felt like her heart had shattered into a million pieces. However, she knew she had to be strong for her son. She had risked her life to give birth to him, and now she would do everything to make him happy. So Marceline began to live for Edward. She tried to fill the void left by her husband, working hard, going to her son's football matches, and working on her computer at night. Marceline was an advertising designer and had completed courses during her maternity leave. 
Her talent helped her quickly earn a good reputation among clients. Living without her beloved was difficult. Marceline thought that when Paul died, part of her heart was ripped out of her chest and buried in the ground. However, time passes and even the deepest wounds can heal. When Edward was 13, Marceline met Ron. Ron was very handsome, especially in his military uniform, since he was an officer. Many years ago, Ron came to the city from the village, enrolled in a military school, and was assigned to the town where Marceline and Edward lived. The future spouses were introduced by mutual friends. Ron immediately fell in love with the modest, sweet Marceline. At first, the woman gently rejected his advances, until her friend tried to talk sense into her. What's wrong with you, Marceline? Have you gone crazy? Ron is an eligible groom. He has a good job, and you're alone, turning your nose up at such a man. Who else will take you with your boy? Your husband has been dead for a long time. It's time to take off the widow's dress. Marceline was surprised and even offended. I'm not saying that Ron is bad. It's just not interesting to me. You're a fool, Marceline. We just want what's best for you, her friend retorted, not expecting resistance. Think for yourself. Edward also needs a male authority figure. You yourself said that he's thinking about a military school. That's what he needs, a stepfather like Ron. It's unclear what tipped the scales of doubt, the words of Marceline's friends or Ron's courtship, but soon she agreed to go on a date with him. One date led to another, then the third. Ron seemed like a simple, kind person, and his soul was open. If I stayed in my village, I would have definitely drunk myself to death. Ron confessed honestly. There's nothing to do there, only drinking. There is no work at all, and I have a bad inheritance. My father was a heavy drinker. Time passed, and Ron quickly found a common language with Marceline's son. They often went out together into nature, to the movies, and to football matches. Gradually, Marceline became attached to Ron. It wasn't the same love she had had for her late husband, but the feelings were sincere and tender. Ron, on the other hand, was head over heels in love with Marceline. Sometimes he acted like a schoolboy in love, showering her with flowers stolen from someone's flower bed, singing songs under her window with his guitar so the annoyance of their neighbours. At night he wrote her name on the pavement so she could see his artwork from the window in the morning. After a year, Ron found out he was being transferred to a new duty station. So without hesitation, he got down on one knee and proposed to Marceline. I want to take you and Edward with me, he said, looking into Marceline's eyes. I can't live without you. Marceline consulted her son because she couldn't make such a decision alone. After all, relocation and a new school could be a tough challenge for a teenager. However, Kind-hearted Edward just hugged his mum and congratulated her. Of course, mum, say yes. Edward confidently nodded. Ron cherishes you. I want you to be happy. Besides, I like him too. But before saying the coveted yes, Marceline sat opposite her fiancé to talk seriously. I won't be able to give you a child, the woman admitted. Firstly, I am no longer young. And secondly, I was forbidden to give birth even to my first one. Nowadays, everything seems not so scary, but I remember how I suffered during pregnancy and childbirth. I could die. Ron kissed her hands. We have Edward, so I will have an heir after all. He smiled. Trust me, everything will be fine. His words melted the woman's heart. She was tired of being alone, carrying everything on her shoulders like a pack horse. Of course, Edward helped her. He was a wonderful son. However, sometimes she just wanted to lean on a man's shoulder. So Marceline agreed. At first, everything went great. Except that Ron drank more often on his new duty station. He usually drank with his military mates and came home swaying. Invariably, 
He brought his wife a bouquet of flowers so she wouldn't scold him and explained his condition with various reasons. Someone's birthday, promotion, or his own promotion. Marceline understood that her husband's service was very stressful and never scolded him. After all, he didn't drink and rage at home, so why get upset or angry? Family problems began later. When Edward turned 15, he became a copy of his father. When Ron's family was invited to a colleague's anniversary party, one of the wives managed to make an inappropriate joke, not realising what wound in Ron's heart she had opened. I wonder who your son takes after. Such a handsome man turned out. He looks like a Hollywood star. Not your breed at all, she announced in a loud voice and winked at Ron. The man joked then, but for the whole evening he was gloomy and thoughtful. After that incident, something changed within him. He had only just realised that he was raising someone else's son and did not have a child of his own. He started arguing with his wife, constantly reproaching her for not wanting to have a child with him and persuading her to take this step. Tell me, don't you love me? Ron would say. Do you really value your dead husband more than me? I'm alive, Marceline, and I love you. I cherish you. And what you? I warned you that it's dangerous for my health. Women should give birth before 30, and with my heart it's not recommended to have a child at all. But you gave birth to Edward. Was it because you loved your first husband more, huh? Everyone might be laughing at me now. I'm raising someone else's son. Time passed, and Ron would either argue with his wife or try to persuade her with kind words. He would tell her how much he dreamed of having a child and how happy she would make him. In the end, Marceline gave in. When Marceline became pregnant again, she went to the doctor after the third month, fearing that she would be forced to terminate it. The pregnancy went smoothly, which surprised Marceline, there weren't even any surprises like morning sickness or swollen legs. By the ninth month, Marceline had calmed down, preparing to meet her daughter. However, it turned out that the easy path can lead to the abyss, while climbing through thorns can lead to stars. Marceline did not survive the birth and complications arose. The doctors couldn't save her. However, the baby survived. She was a little girl, small and fragile, like a delicate butterfly. She was named Lucy, as her mother had said before she passed away. Unfortunately for Lucy, she lost not only her mother, but also her father on the day of her birth. Ron, having lost his beloved wife, began to search for someone to blame for her death. Deep down he knew he was to blame for everything, but he couldn't admit it. At first he blamed the doctors and demanded a trial, but there were no medical errors. Then he found another scapegoat, his own newborn daughter. The father was angry with the baby. Meanwhile, Edward had completed his first year at military school. He came home for his mother's funeral, and he was the one who had to take care of Lucy. Ron never came near her. He seemed to have forgotten about her existence. Ron just drank drowning in alcohol in his grief. Edward, who himself was in pain, thought that his stepfather was also going through a difficult time, so he did not ask why. He, not Ron, was changing diapers and making formula to feed Lucy. However, soon Edward realised that the problem was much deeper than he thought. That evening, there was a suffocating silence in the apartment. Ron was drinking again, sitting in the kitchen, Edward was frying potatoes for dinner when he heard the baby cry. The young man immediately left the kitchen and went to his room. He dragged the baby's crib there to keep a closer eye on Lucy. He dragged the baby's crib there to keep a closer eye on Lucy. However, his stepfather's voice made him stop in his tracks. It sounded scarier than the baby's cries. I wish that brat was never born, he said hoarsely. You know, I'm thinking of putting her in an orphanage. What? Edward turned around, thinking he had misheard. The man knocked back his shot, sniffed a piece of lemon before tossing it into his mouth. 
I can't stand to look at her. Don't want to touch her. What's the point of her being here? Nobody needs her, he said. I need her, Edward clenched his fists. Just try to take Lucy away from here. Ron looked at his stepson with red and cloudy eyes. What are you talking about? She killed your mother, he barked, slamming his fist on the table. You demanded a child from her, he yelled back. So you're to blame. Ron tried to get up from the table in anger, with the clear intention of teaching his stepson a lesson, but his body failed him, causing him to stumble and fall back onto the chair. Lucy was still crying, calling for her brother, as she knew no other warmth. Edward rushed to his little sister. He took the baby in his arms, seeing that her face was already red from tears. Hush, little sister, he muttered. I won't let anyone hurt you. Listening to her brother's heartbeat, Lucy fell asleep again. However, Edward did not return to the kitchen. He locked himself in his room and sat there until morning, not letting the baby out of his sight. He thought a lot. When it's summer and you're a handsome 19-year-old guy, you want to enjoy your youth, go to nightclubs, have fun, and make new acquaintances. However, Edward's future was different. That night, he made a difficult decision for himself. He took an academic leave from the military school, intending to take care of his younger sister. He hoped that in a year, when the baby grows up, his stepfather will come to his senses. He must be going through terrible stress from losing his wife right now. He needs time, Edward thought. However, he did not understand why no one gave him that time for grieving. He also lost the closest person. Only Edward was a real son of his mother and did not allow himself to drown in sorrow. Just as Marceline found salvation in her child, Edward found solace in Lucy. Meanwhile, Ron did not get any better. He was constantly dissatisfied with his children. He continued to drink and curse. The man never helped his stepson with his daughter. Ron was away for a long time on duty. Once every three months, he brought some food, gave his stepson a little money, and accompanied it with comments, "'You'd die here without me, huh?' Then he nodded at his daughter, and what's she screaming about again? Is she retarded or something? Edward felt sick of being dependent on his stepfather. Soon he realized that things couldn't go on like this. There was no talk of returning to military school. Ron wouldn't pay for a nanny, and Edward didn't have the money, so he dropped the idea of becoming a soldier. Edward started thinking about what he was good at, and where he could work without leaving home. The answer, as it turned out, was right in front of him. Once, an old client sent a message to Edward's mother, not knowing that she had died. Edward read the message without much enthusiasm. It turned out that the client offered a good fee for a series of advertising posters. Edward typed a concise and slightly biting response on the keyboard that his mother had died and they, to his deepest regret, would have to find another designer. However, he didn't send it. His fingers froze on the button. He reread the technical task again then stopped at the fee and swallowed saliva. Really? muttered Edward. He glanced at Lucy. She was sitting on the floor sorting toys. Her faded dress bothered Edward. He was tired of washing it. The baby got things dirty quickly and his stepfather didn't give money to buy new ones. The older brother closed his eyes. He tiredly rubbed his face. He remembered the words Ron yelled at him in the face yesterday spraying saliva and breathing booze. Get rid of this retarded girl out of my sight. He pointed at the crying girl with a shaking finger. I don't want to see her. She killed her mother. She's a monster. Ron raged only because little Lucy fell and hurt herself. Seeing this, the man decided she was underdeveloped. Thinking about all this, Edward erased his response and wrote a new one. Everything will be done. From that day on, he used every free minute to learn or create. Fortunately, Edward inherited artistic talent from his mother, 
School teachers always noted this, making him draw posters for competitions and school events, but he'd never paid much attention until now. This time, he took a risk. He took his mother's graphic tablet, started studying programs and the intricacies of design art. When he sent his work to the customer, his heart beat so hard in his chest that it felt like he had already run a marathon. Edward waited for an answer all day. By evening, he had already despaired, deciding that they had seen through him and the works would be sent back and criticised. After all, his mother was a professional and he was self-taught. And besides, time was short. However, when Edward was feeding his sister, making a spoon airplane and buzzing, he received a response. Everything is cool. We send it to print. Where should we transfer the money? Edward let out a loud exhalation and then laughed. Lucy didn't understand what made her brother laugh, but she also started laughing. Edward looked at her dirty face with traces of dinner, picked up his little sister and hugged her. Remembering that the child had just eaten, the boy calmed down, but still hugged the baby to him. Everything will be fine with us, Lucy, he promised. Edward kept his promise. He took on tasks for designers, worked in any spare time. With each completed project, he became more inspired, constantly developing skills and following trends in the world of graphic design. Of course, there were also unpleasant moments. For example, difficult clients with numerous revisions. Once, someone cheated Edward out of a payment for a job. From that moment on, he implemented a system of prepayment. Although he endured Ron's reproaches, Edward didn't tell his stepfather anything about his new income. Instead, he simply saved money until he could leave his stepfather's home. When it occurred, he went to court to take custody of Lucy. Ron didn't resist, as his daughter was never important to him. But that was only the beginning of the story for the brother and sister. When Lucy was two and a half years old, she already spoke well. She called Edward either brother or daddy, as she didn't know another father. She also became very curious and asked millions of questions. One evening, as Edward was putting his little sister to bed, he told her a fairy tale. He couldn't remember the plot of Cinderella or Puss in Boots, so he made up beautiful stories on the spot about princesses, knights, dragons and other fairy creatures. "'What was the elf like?' Lucy asked him in the middle of the story. "'Um,' Edward stumbled, "'with pointy ears and white hair. "'Pointy? What does that mean?' If you fall asleep, I'll draw it in the morning, Edward promised, yawning. Lucy tried to fall asleep. She really wanted to see the elf, and Edward had to keep his promise. He drew a beautiful elf when Lucy sat on his lap, then a dragon, and then a princess in a ball gown. When Lucy became afraid of the dark, Edward invented a tale about fairies who lived on little stars and came to sleeping girls in their dreams. Lucy also asked him to draw the fairies. They know what I look like, but I don't know what they look like, the child exclaimed. Edward began drawing illustrations for his own fairy tales to delight his sister. This is how books authored by Edward appeared in their library. One of his friends saw the books and suggested that Edward publish them online. What if someone buys them? He shrugged. The books are cool. Edward shrugged, but didn't dismiss the idea. What he didn't expect was the insane popularity of his work. So, Edward went from being an advertising designer to a children's book author. The stories were touching and kind because he told them to his beloved sister. Later, fame descended upon the brother and sister. People loved the story of a young man who cared for his younger sister and wrote her fairy tales. Edward was embarrassed by the attention, but it led to something wonderful. One day, a young woman came to their house. Blushing, she asked Edward for an interview for the newspaper. Her name was Maggie. She was a student on an internship. 
She was told to take an interview of anyone worthy of admiration. She chose Edward, as she was subscribed to his social media account, and even bought his books. She asked him to sign them. Do you have brothers or sisters? Edward asked. No, the girl blushed and then looked at him slyly. Maybe I'm also afraid to sleep alone in the dark. Do you have any advice for adult girls? Later, Maggie confessed that she was embarrassed by her silly flirting. She had no experience of communicating with men, and Edward really wanted to impress her, so she blurted out something she read in a woman's magazine. However, it was precisely the fact that Megan blushed to the roots of her hair and flirted with Edward that made him laugh. Two years later, Maggie became his fiancée, and later his wife. Meanwhile, Lucy grew up as a happy child who knew no sorrow. Although she didn't have parents, her brother replaced them all. He sacrificed a lot just to make her smile. A child's smile is worth all the treasure of this world. At least that's what Edward thought. And fate rewarded him in the end.